terms of some kind of change of cultural patterns of the mentality patterns or, or, or something like that. Um, just like a really obvious example of the hippie movement in the States in the 60s and all the things that it cherished not only in, in, in trying to prevent and stop the war but also like change the, the mentality of culture of people. Great question. Um, it reminds me too of Gandhi's distinction between uh, resistance and what he called constructive program, which is building the alternative, building something new, establishing through different types of peaceful interventions, um, cultural changes or, or um, alternative institutions, alternative economic arrangements, and, and things that uh, bring out justice in society. Um, it is uh, definitely true that um, some people have started to collect data on manifestations like that. Um, I'm not one of the people that have collected those data systematically, but there is a great resource called the Swarthmore uh, Global Nonviolent Action Database that George Lakey has developed, and it actually includes, it includes things as diverse as um, the campaign against the blood feud in Kosovo um, to the um, Sri Lankan veterinarians pushing for better conditions for elephants. Um, I mean, it's, it's just a, a really diverse set of campaigns and cases that are really interesting. And um, what I can tell you is that it does introduce a series of difficulties when you're trying to measure their impact um, because their impacts are likely to be a bit slower to observe. Um, and less direct to observe, but um, but certainly uh, the expression of new alternatives is necessary for any type of paradigm change in the in the world. Um, and so uh, you know when people are talking about alternatives to capitalism or trying to dismantle global capital, uh, to me the the main barrier for that is the lack of an alternative that people find attractive. Um, we were talking about Zizek earlier, unfortunately, <laughs> and he, one of the things he says is, is I can imagine the end of the world before the end of capitalism. I can too. That's the only thing he says that I like. Um, I can imagine that too, um, and so that's why we have to start imagining things that are better, um, so that we can then take them up and we can, we can engage in proactive action to realize the things in the world that will make it better. Another question, so maybe one or two more questions and then we will easily finish this panel. Hello, uh, my name is Natasha and I come from a feminist organization and I want to thank you for a very interesting lecture. Um, my question would be, um, I would like to hear uh, your thinking or opinion around mobilizations around sexual and reproductive health and rights. We have March for Life in US and all around the world and we have we had uh, Black Monday protests in Poland. So what was your opinion around these mobilizations or any thinking? Yes, so I think this is related to the question about, you know, who should get to use nonviolent resistance toward what ends. And certainly in my case, um, I'm a feminist as well and, you know, believe that, um, that um, you know, women's equality is a necessity and assuring all of the things that people would want to uh, see in the world. And so it's disappointing when people um, use the opportunity to protest and assemble uh, to try to um, try to take away rights from women. Um, but uh, one thing I can tell you is that there is more work being done on the question of the primacy of women's role in nonviolent campaigns. And in particular, uh, one of my colleagues, Mary King, has made the claim that there isn't a single um, episode of progress um, in feminist outcomes, whether it is reproductive and sexual rights, whether it is, um, you know, gender quotas and parliaments or anything that would be kind of indicative of a, of a, a feminist outcome, that um, there wasn't a civil resistance campaign being 
behind it. So in other words, um, mass nonviolent resistance by and for women has been part of the story with every single development um, in, in kind of feminist history, and I, I think that's true. Um, and so I've been starting to collect data on uh, women's primacy and position in civil resistance movements. And uh, one of the next data collection, um, or some of the next data that I will release actually looks at things like how many women are involved in peak events in these movements? Are they involved in formal leadership positions in these movements? Do the movements adopt explicitly uh, gender equal ideology? Are they making demands in public uh, around gender equality? Are they um, experiencing gender-based violence as a result of their activism from within the movement or outside of it? Um, and I think that will help us to understand much more and make much more strong claims about um, the way that women advance all of our rights, not just um, feminist uh, outcomes. Another project that's underway um, with a colleague, Marie Berry, is actually looking more at the tactical level for how women position themselves in movements um, to maintain nonviolent discipline and prevent repression. So we're actually using user-generated photos from protest events from the past 15 years um, to find where women are standing and what they're wearing and whether they're differentiated from the men. And we're going to correlate those with incidents of um, the lack of violence uh, in the campaign. So it's actually, there's a lot of research being done um, around women particularly, and we'll know much more uh, after that about then how that correlates with things like reproductive rights and women's equality in societies. I guess that was the last question from the audience, or is there any burning question? No. I'll just then use the opportunity maybe to close up with one maybe half personal question. Oh, half personal. <laughs> half personal. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. it's personal. <laughs> and um, I mean, now after your tremendous work you have done, you became quite popular in academia, I would say, and you gave a talk, speeches all across, across the world. And one impression that I'm always having as a peace activist is how difficult it is actually to talk about peace and non-violence and people actually to take you seriously. I mean, if tonight we have organized discussion how to overturn the dictator through the military tactics, I guess we will attract much more audience than when we are talking how to overturn the dictators in, uh, through non-violence. So, your personal feeling, when you talk about non-violence in academia, how serious you are perceived and do you see the impact and why it's so difficult to talk on non-violence? And is it, or is it just my stupid impression that it's difficult to talk about this and non-violence? No, I think, it, I think it is. There are people have a lot of baggage around it. Um, and part of it is because I think advocates of peace and non-violence have been very normatively oriented in a way that um, a lot of mainstream academics find difficult to kind of accommodate in a more positivist kind of um, um, orientation. Um, but the other thing is just people think it's naive because we haven't done enough, we honestly haven't done enough research um, to demonstrate that it is not naive. In fact, this is one of um, the Vatican's main uh, claims right now is that it's not that there aren't alternatives to violence, it's just that we have spent almost no time trying to understand them. Like, relative to how much time we've devoted to understanding use of violence and, and military force, and justifying it. So why don't we try to spend just a tiny fraction of that time trying to seriously research alternatives to violence and develop a moral framework around it that appeals to people and that resonates with people. And the reason I'm so excited about the Vatican doing this is because I think just war doctrine, we've so internalized it as a, as a world. It's been the prevailing um, normative frame for understanding violence and our right to it for the last 2,000 years, right? So, so what if we have a major global leader like the Vatican come out and tell 800 million people that they have to start taking nonviolence seriously <laughs> liturgically and personally, and they have to face the hard questions, and where will we be a couple hundred years from now if people start taking it seriously? Um, so I think that um, it, is, it can be difficult and lonely 
being a nonviolence and peace person, but we're growing in our numbers. The data help. More, more, more people are writing doctoral dissertations on the topic than ever before. Um, we have more resources and toolkits and revolution manuals and everything else than ever before. We have videos, we have children's books, <laughs> we have peace study centers everywhere in the world. Um, and it just takes some time to, to change paradigms, but we're working on it and somebody's got to start. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. part of the program, but yes, stay here and if you have a question to Erika, she will be with us next half an hour and then she will have to leave. Thank you very much for coming and we will see you in the next one. Thank you very much.